my name is Chuku Magu again. I really didn't know we were, were thinking along the same line as the IMF. Maybe that's because the issue is becoming very, very critical. Worrying about why Africa is growing and um, not diversifying at the same time. And um, we want to take this specifically from a policy perspective. And we, we think that among other sets of problems, there is a macroeconomic policy challenge. And that's that over the years, most African countries have grown on one basic premise. And that premise is the premise of stabilization. We simply say, get the prices right, remove all distortions, ensure you have stable external balance, and then growth and diversification should automatically follow. Now, we, given the available data, we are trying to query that particular macroeconomic start point. And that's, in sum, what this work is all about. Is it possible that maybe the sort of instruments, the kind of emphasis given to them, and uh, related issues, particularly historical and policy context issues, may have affected uh, diversification efforts in many African countries. So I want to go about this by first showing evidence of concurrence of improved macro balances with deterioration uh, in diversification. Then secondly, we discuss the kind of uh, evidence we are getting from an economic analysis of uh, panel data of uh, 21 countries in Africa. And then uh, maybe punctuate that with uh, about four country case studies. And then bring in our own theoretical insights, what we think, because we are trying to also look at a model, what we think should be the model for African development. Now on stability and growth, this and diversification, this is Africa's GDP growth. I don't need to go over this again. Many of us already know them, comparing Africa to others. But interestingly too, Africa is not only growing on GDP. It has also been reducing debt. And what we have there is the continent's, the continent's uh, debt service to exports. And it is the lowest, interestingly. Sorry, Sub-Saharan Africa at the end of there. It's about the lowest. On consumer prices, Africa has also not done badly at all. In fact, Africa used to be very volatile. Many of us know, particularly on consumer prices, that also has changed significantly, both for Sub-Saharan Africa and the whole of Africa as a, as a region. And the commodity price story, we already know. So we just try to uh, give a list of the different sub-segments, metals, petroleum, non-energy, energy, agricultural materials, and so on. But here, we think we, there is a, a very important story that needs to be told. And this is where we have a first puzzle. This is export value index. Virtually every region over the last three decades have added uh, very significantly, except Sub-Saharan Africa and Africa. So with all the growth that has happened in Africa, nothing has changed here, and nothing has changed here. And we think that In addition to several other factors that may be responsible, um, we are aware of the, the Dutch disease uh, story has been well told. But in addition to that, it's weak in the industry and sectoral spillovers. And then what uh, some of us have described as toxic political, uh, eco political economy effects. Now, that what is happening now 
has been that Africa is not diversifying at home, nor diversifying in its export basket. Now, we try to also show uh, the domestically now, manufacturing and industry value added here, the trends over the last uh, 30 years or so. Again, uh, manufacturing moves up to about 1988 and then started dropping and has kept dropping as a share in GDP across board. Whereas industry has managed to at least retain some measure of uh, growth. Agriculture has also been dropping from about nearly 35% to uh, barely 24% now. Whereas um, services had also been rising. And we try to describe that as a servicification of the, of the economy. Now, there is something subtle about the services sector in Africa, and that is that it comes with very low value added. It is really not in any way better than agricultural value. The kind of product that are delivered on the services sector that is now replacing agriculture domestically is not uh, in any way superior to the kind of services or product that were coming from agriculture prior to now. And we find that very problem problematic. So one of the first things we tried to do was to check the drivers of growth. What is driving sectoral growth in Africa across board? And I'm just going to summarize the findings without bothering you with the details of the, of the estimates. We find out first and foremost that across board, many of the major macro indices that are supposed to be, or macro instruments that are supposed to be the, the key handle for government in Africa are not really important in deciding what happens at the sectoral levels. Whether it's um, money supply or uh, government expenditure or uh, any other kind of, uh, many of them are not important in defining what happens sectorally. Now we try to take a look at, the, at a few countries, but I'm going to skip that. Cameroon, Morocco, Nigeria, and Uganda. Looking at first, what's happening sectorally, and then what's happening at the export level, and then uh, importantly too, what is happening on export value index and domestic inflation as measures of stability and, um, and diversification. Now, what implications do we draw from this? First and foremost, we think that Knox's message about the, the necessity of structural variables as opposed to what we have over the years termed policy variables are very important. Now, interestingly, we find that uh, in the literature, diversification matters for sure, particularly for macro uh, stability. And one of the challenges is that in most African countries, there is actually, uh, there are two sectors. What we've come to know in the literature as dualism. Very high productive enclave sector that is very small, most of which is exporting. And then low productivity you know, uh, sectors that, that uh, service the domestic economy for most African countries. Now, and we think that it is the relationship, it is the, it is the interaction between these two sectors and the sort of inf incentives that are being generated by the, by the resources emanating from the export uh, revenues that are responsible for the kind of behavior we see at the domestic level. So, while it is true that diversification supports macro stability. We've not been able to establish that uh, stability is very critical for diversification or that stability drives diversification. Not much of that in the literature. So part of what we are doing is to also raise a, a theoretical foundation to be able to make the link between them. And we think that the major, uh, major emphasis or the major message may have to move away from what we have had as 
neoclassical policy measures that are adopted by most of the African countries to begin to look at structural instruments as advocated by Knox and of course others in, the, in that same school of thought. So, we think that there are roles for public finance here. And the role for public finance is, is simply to say, think of ways of taxing the export sector and then using the, use the revenues to grow the, the, the non-export sector. Now, I want to maybe take us behind to some of, the, some of the thinking that we have here. First and foremost, ordinarily, what drives specialization in most African countries is what we call comparative advantage. We, have, we are naturally endowed with this, so we should produce this. Now, unfortunately, comparative advantage on its own, can automatically determine the area of focus. But unless there is specific attempt by the government to begin to improve um, profitability, which is really what, what should or what drives investment in actual fact. Now, unless the government deliberately makes attempt to improve profitability, it will not be possible for investors or entrepreneurs to begin to move resources from those areas of natural comparative advantage to the areas that are needed driven by demand. And that is uh, the summary of what we think, that the government de therefore needs to um, begin to think of how to utilize taxation of the revenues first, move them over to the production of non-tradables and improve wages in the process, also tax the wages and use the, the proceeds to be able to produce what we call public overhead. And that without this, it may be very, very impossible, very, very difficult for um, Africa to be able to make the kind of translation from this specialization in uh, tradables, particularly industry and uh, natural resources, to be able to move over to the production of uh, other tradables that are also uh, high value added. I think I want to uh, stop the discussion here. And uh, thanks very much, Tony.